Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Angela Court McKenzie coming to you from Scotland today and I'm very excited to have all of you joining us. Whether you're joining us on social media on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or on television on the Super Channel, especially there in Orlando. Welcome to everybody. Listen, if you're watching on social media, be sure and say hi and let me know where you're watching from and tell your friends that you want to stay for this program. The Angela program is about bringing interviews and stories of lives because it matters. It matters uh, because it's talking about life and redemption through Jesus Christ. And today our guest is here to share his story. It's a magnificent story of God's goodness throughout his life. Um, my guest is uh, the Reverend Jonathan Aiken from London. He'll be joining us in just a moment. Uh, he was raised really uh, and grew up in a life of privilege education, opportunity, all of those beautiful things which we wish for, went into politics uh, and the seats of power in parliament, served with uh, John Major's cabinet, knew Margaret Thatcher, the famous, uh, as I call her, the Iron Lady, had all kinds of great things going, but in a twist and turn of events, uh, he was convicted of perjuring himself in a moment uh, in 1999, went to prison. And out of that, though, I uh, had a powerful renewal through, through salvation in Christ and went to Oxford and today is a priest. Now, that could be enough for an entire week of program, but we're going to try to get his story in uh, in this half hour show. But let everybody know that uh, Reverend Jonathan Aiken is with us because I really believe you're going to be blessed uh, by hearing his story. So without further ado, I want to welcome from London to the program, Reverend Jonathan Aiken. Welcome. Good to be with you. We're so happy you're here. Uh, Jonathan, take us through a little bit of your life story. Uh, again, I was sharing about what I hope that this program accomplishes, which is an opportunity, a platform for folks to hear the stories of redemption. And yours is very interesting. You were telling me earlier that your family, actually the Aiken family, was close friends with the Churchills. Yes, that's true. Um, the friendship really dated back to um, the First World War because my great uncle, who was called Max Aitken, but he became Lord Beaverbrook, was the only person besides Winston Churchill to be a cabinet minister in the war cabinet of World War I, which is where they got to know each other. And then again, in World War II, Churchill was prime minister. My uncle Max was the Minister for Aircraft Production, which is a very vital job during the Battle of Britain producing the Spitfires. But they were also enormously close friends, and they went on being close friends long into uh, their old age. I went to dinner once or twice with the great Winston Churchill at my Uncle Max's house, and then I myself was a good friend, close friend of Winston Churchill the second, always known as Little Winston, who was my contemporary at school and at Oxford. So I knew the family very well. So it would seem kind of a natural progression for you to consider a life of public service uh, and politics. But before that, you uh, loved journalism. And I believe you were even a journalist in conflicts, including the Vietnam War. Yes, I, um, first of all, like most people went to school, I uh, came out of Oxford with a law degree but was then tempted away into something a long way from law, which was journalism and particularly war correspondent journalism. Very exciting. There's nothing so exciting as being shot at and missed as Winston Churchill once said, he was a young war correspondent. Uh, but uh, my war correspondent days were in the Vietnam War. And uh, I was out there for a couple of years, very exciting years, um, the Tet Offensive. And for various reasons I got to know a lot of the big American correspondents quite well, like Walter Cronkite and uh, Arno de Borsgrav and Joe Alsop and Stuart Alsop and others I could mention. The reason I got to know them so well was partly because the community of war correspondents was a pretty small one, but also because there was a curious rule operated by the war authorities, which is that uh, American correspondents or any other kind of correspondents always had to go with a buddy. They were never allowed to travel on their own. And buddies don't really like going with a buddy who might uh, be a competitor 
but I was not a competitor, of course, to um, the great American journalism. I mean, how could I compete with Walter Cronkite when I was 23 years old uh, or with Joe Alsop? But they still needed a buddy to be the guy who went along with them to all kinds of exciting war zones and so on. So I, I got to know, and like a lot of very interesting Americans, very much indeed during that Vietnam experience, which was a pretty grim one, but it was certainly an experience for the cavalry. Right, and thankfully you came through that safe and sound, uh, but if you don't mind, let's drop back to your college days. There's a little fact, a, con a Florida connection, I'd love to make for our viewers, especially our friends watching on the Super Channel in Orlando or wherever you're watching from around the world. But this is an interesting one. Tell us about, you came to Gainesville, Florida once uh, on behalf of your school. What was that about? Yes, I, I was a student debater. And at the age of 19, I won a prize which resulted in being one of two British debaters who went around for six months American colleges and American universities all over the country, from Yale and Harvard to Ole Miss, Mississippi, still a segregated university in 63. Oh, and then uh, suddenly we arrived to one of our stops on the tour at the University of Gainesville in Florida. And I remember so vividly seeing at the University of Gainesville a whole lot of trampolines and trapezes and high wires uh, right in the middle of the campus. And we thought, what on earth is this about? And we were told, and we thought that we, our legs were being pulled, and we told that at the University of Gainesville in 63, you could get a degree in circusology. Uh, it was a university that actually taught the arts of the circus, lion taming and acrobatics and uh, I don't know what, but um, this seemed a long way from the groves of Academe of Oxford where we learned things like Latin, Latin and Greek. <laughs> well, I tell you, University of Florida is uh, a part of prestigious school today. I'm sure we've all come far from uh, circusology, but I, I did not know that University of Florida back in the 60s offered a degree in circusology, but there, yeah, there's, sure a little, <laughs> there's a little known fact. But you came to the university campus and you did uh, a debating session there. So that's, that's a very interesting thing. You must have been quite on the game if you were representing Oxford. So moving now from university through your correspondence years, what moved you to consider a life in politics and public service? Well, I, I guess it was sort of in the blood to some extent. Um, I was talking earlier about my famous Uncle Max, but my father was a member of parliament. Uh, other relatives were uh, members of parliament. I knew a lot of members of Parliament because they were family friends, and I'd been keen on debating at Oxford. And in those days, back in Britain, um, where there is no carpet bagging in the way there is in the United States, uh, an ambitious young man can come straight out of university. And if you can find a district which will say, come and be uh, our candidate for Congress or Parliament, in our case, uh, he can get a ride and get a fight. And I did get a fight age 23 uh, in the, near the city of Birmingham in Britain and uh, fought a very exciting election campaign because it was a very tight election. And so from then on, I was hooked on the idea of one day um, becoming a member of parliament. And in due course, I did. Yes, and served a number of years in a number of different positions. Was your Christian faith active at this time? I never completely lost my Christian faith. Um, I always had it, uh, but I would say that really throughout most of my political career, I was at best a half Christian, which I now know is about as valuable as being half pregnant. But at the time, I thought it was absolutely fine to be a sort of uh, do, do some things well on Sunday and then forget about them for the rest of the week. And I didn't really obey the teachings of Christ. Yeah, but I know that um, uh, faith always was there in a small flutter, flickering light in my life. It wasn't extinguished or ignored or certainly not mocked. I, I believed in a living God. I just served him extremely badly for most of the first 50 years of my life. What, uh, 
what was the changing point? You were in the powers, uh, with the powers that be uh, in the inner circle with Margaret Thatcher. And I'll ask you a little bit more about her in a couple of minutes, um, serving and your, your faith was kind of compartmentalized to a Sunday morning service. But uh, t take us kind of when Jonathan, who was on this amazing trajectory, probably to the path of prime ministership, if I could be so bold to say, and things change. Tell us, tell us your story. Well, what changed is that when I was um, on the upward path and indeed tipped as a future prime minister, although rather like being future president, that's not a very exclusive club. You could fill a vast auditorium of people who've been so oh, one day he'll be president or he'll be a prime minister. But so um, I was still- Or she. And she, yes, indeed. We, were, we, we didn't think like that when I was going through my early political life. But yes, indeed, uh, she. Uh, anyway, I was on the rise. I was in the cabinet. I was I had, had various interesting jobs. I was uh, what you would call Secretary of the Treasury. I had been Defence Secretary. Um, so I was doing well. And, uh, and when you... Um, get into those kind of positions. The newspapers and the journalists take a lot, lot of interest in you. And they start shining torches into places perhaps you got they didn't shine put torches into. And cut a long story short, I got into trouble. It's too long and complicated story to say what I got into trouble about, but it really wasn't at the beginning very serious. But I made a serious mistake as so often in life and in Watergate, for example, it's not the actual first mistake that counts. It's the cover-up of the mistake that counts. And in my case, I covered up a relatively uh, small matter, which was that I stayed in a Paris hotel. My uh, bill was picked up by a good friend, but he was also an Arab prince. Uh, and when I was confronted to this uh, matter, which was technically against the ministerial rules for accepting hospitality, instead of saying, well, I accepted hospitality from a friend. It might have been all right. But instead, I said, no, no, my wife paid the bill. Well, that was a lie. And I got caught out telling it. And I paid a very heavy price for that lie. Yes, in 1999, you were found guilty of perjuring against yourself. And a heavy sentence, 18 months for that one um, mistake. So, I mean... <sighs> I, I would assume everything just began to unravel because it seems like the folks who who are in very prestigious powers, uh, positions of power in politics or leadership, when there's a tipping, it, it, sometimes it seems it all tipped. Did it? What was? I think you kind of told me you called it the royal flush or something like that. Yes, I, I think uh, I sometimes say, in a comparatively short period from having been a future prime minister and notion, I went through the downward spiral of defeat, disgrace, divorce, bankruptcy, and jail. Oh and that is a pretty, <laughs> and that's a pretty good royal flash of crises by anybody's standards. So then at the end of that very painful descent, I was in a prison cell in um, a big London prison called HMP Belmarsh. And uh, that's where I began my relatively short it's still painful and difficult prison sentence. While you were there, someone I think named, a good man named Chuck Colson reached out to you, others reached out to you, and sitting there kind of in the, the solidarity of a, a prison life, you began to reconsider things and can, including your faith. Yes, uh, Chuck Colson was a bit of a friend of mine before I got into trouble. I, we had a mutual friend in common, I liked him enormously, but I didn't share his um, uh, strong faith, I respected it. But uh, when I got into spectacular trouble and was heading towards prison, uh, Chuck Colson did reach out to me, so did other people, but Chuck became, instead of rather a superficial friendly acquaintance, he became a deep friend and counselor and we sometimes used to say together that maybe we're the only two people in the world who 
uh, had great political office, risen very high, and then crashed dramatically, gone to jail, and then found Christ uh, in the course of that descent. That was the story of Chuck Colson, and it was my story too. Uh, and Chuck definitely influenced me. Uh, so did other Christians who wonderfully, during this painful period, came alongside me. So uh, before I got to prison, I was um, really committing myself in a serious, uh, deep way to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And his power uh, kept me going through jail, which had its own experiences too. And when I came tell out us, of jail... Tell us about one. Tell us about one of your experiences there. Because here you are, jail has, yeah. it, it's, it's the common ground of all. I mean, all kinds of folks are, you know, might be found from different kinds of backgrounds. So here you were from this prestigious, wonderful family at, with, with all kinds of other folks that have found themselves in this position. Any, any interesting tales you should tell, you, you want to share? Well, I have about two books full of interesting tales, but... <laughs> yes, uh, I'm going to mention I that. Mean, prison is a little bit like, I imagine, what being in the trenches were in World War One. They're pretty miserable, but the shared experience makes you rub along with all kinds of people you never wanted to be uh, with in the first place. But out of that strange mixture, you start to, like some people, you start to feel that they are... Um, strong characters obviously they've made mistakes but they're still rather good often compassionate characters and one particular irish burglar uh, said to me would you like to come along to our prayer group one evening and in those days i was a very buttoned up englishman to whom praying out loud was um something you'd rather go to the dentist without an anesthetic than pray out loud with anybody it was sort of unknown um but anyway, I did in this prison. And these fellow prisoners, who were extraordinary collection, there was a, um, a burglar, a couple of murderers, of a, a forger, there was a pickpocket, there was um, a, a couple of Irish burglars that made, gave a new meaning to the Christian term, a cell group. We were all <laughs> getting together to pray. Uh, and um, pray we did every night. Just, time is not of the essence in prison life and that prayer group had a big influence on me and so did prison life generally and I think almost before I, uh, I came out of prison I had a feeling that if I did any Christian ministry of any kind I wasn't in those days thinking remotely excuse me being a, um, a, a, a pastor a clergyman ordained but I thought if I came out of prison I would actually like to do some Christian service to prisoners and ex-offenders and I gradually started to do that and I then after I came out of prison I made an unusual career decision I went to the one place in Britain which had worse food more uncomfortable beds than a prison and this was an Anglican seminary called Wycliffe Hall Oxford and I spent <laughs> rather longer there than I did in prison uh, studying under some brilliant teachers um, who are some of them are, uh, well known in the United States, like Alistair McGrath and Michael Green and Graham Tomlin and so on. But I had two wonderful years at Wycliffe really studying theology, studying the Christian gospel, learning Greek, learning a bit of Hebrew. I even wrote a book about the Psalms while I was at Wycliffe, which um, was made some impact on some of my readers' lives. So I was very much by this time completely committed uh, to serving Christ. I didn't quite know how or why or in what format, but I thought probably prison was where I could serve best. So I came out of Wycliffe, I think in the year 2003, um, but still not knowing anything more than perhaps I would do something in prison ministry. And I did, mainly through Chuck Colson's charity, which is called Prison Charity, Prison Fellowship. I was on the board of Prison Fellowship for a time, did a lot of prison ministry in the United States, went a lot around with Chuck Colson to Death Rose in Texas and things like that. But all the time, I was 
in the service of Christ in the prisons. And I was, meanwhile, I was also earning my living um, as an author, um, yes. and mainly as a Christian author, but also as still, because I had my roots in politics, I was a political biographer and a political author. So I did that as well on the side, alongside prison ministries. So I was a lay pastor and a professional author. And I wrote political biographies of Margaret Thatcher, for example, which was a good bestseller. She always has her fans, uh, has her enemies too. I also wrote a biography of President Richard Nixon, who has his enemies too. But these were very interesting books to write. And um, so I eked out a living as an author and as a journalist. Um, but my passion, I think, away from sitting at the computer and writing books uh, was to be a preacher of the gospel, particularly in prisons. Yes, and I believe it was uh, three years ago that after uh, interviews, uh, a time of consideration and dedication, you were ordained uh, as a priest in the Anglican yes. Church, and we have some lovely photos we'd like to share because Kenneth and I actually were honored to be with you uh, well, that day there in, uh, at the church and just a beautiful ceremony there in St. Paul's Cathedral. And there we are with uh, Ralph Veerman, friend Ralph Veerman. And uh, Jonathan, when you were ordained, the service was so beautiful and Kenneth was there in his kilt and then another friend, Peter McDonald, was That's there right. beside you. And what was that? What was, was that the friends that are to walk you down? What well, is that the, in the um, Anglican Church, the service of ordination is highly ceremonial as well as being deeply spiritual. And I was ordained in what is really London's finest church and biggest church. Everyone thinks Westminster Abbey is the best and biggest and in some ways it is, but the even bigger one is St. Paul's Cathedral. And uh, about 3,000 people came into that wonderful 17th century building. And the rules are that every uh, candidate for ordination who is about to be uh, blessed uh, and ordained by the bishop walks down the aisle with a couple of supporters. And I chose as my supporters, uh, certainly the best dressed men of the, the whole day, but they were also really best friends. One was your husband, Kenneth, who had uh, been a good friend for the last 20 years. And the other was Peter MacDonald, son of Al MacDonald, who had a great Christian ministry in the United States and in Europe through Trinity Forum and through the MacDonald Foundation. So they were very natural choices to me. And they um, also look better dressed than anyone except the bishop <laughs> on, on the well, day. Let's share, let's share the video of them walking you down in beautiful St. Paul's Cathedral on the day of your ordination. And we'll be right back. Well, my guest today is the Reverend Jonathan Aiken, and I encourage you to check out any of his 18 books that he's written. He's a prolific author. Uh, you can see his own story called Pride and Perjury, and his other books, including uh, books about Margaret Thatcher, Richard Nixon, which could be, uh, Jonathan, it could be their own program. So we'll have to have you back to give us a little insight on those two very interesting characters in history. But as we come to the end of our program, you've been very transparent in sharing your story, the ups and downs, the ins and outs. But um, I was wondering if, if you would also just share with the viewers, you know, we could have some folks watching today who are in positions of power, influential, and um, any advice you would give them concerning really, instead of compartmentalizing their faith to to bring their faith into their everyday life, their work life? 
Well, I think the first bit of advice, which I, of course, did not take myself, is to make Jesus Christ and his teachings central and fundamental to one's own life. Um, if he is the rock on which one's faith is based, if he is the example and the star you stir by, uh, you may have some disappointing times, but you will never um, come horribly unstuck. He will always be with you. Um, but if you do come unstuck, I think uh, there are one or two biblical texts worth bearing in mind. First, which is not restricted from the Bible, but as Martin Luther said, it, he said, it is in our pain and in our, and in our brokenness that we come cl closest to Christ. And that was certainly my discovery that it's in the depths. There's a wonderful psalm I love, Psalm 130, which begins, out of the depths of I cried to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice, Lord, be attentive to my cry for mercy. And if you steep yourselves in the scriptures, um, you will find there are all kinds of wonderful answers and signposts to a uh, completed change, maybe, but a much happier life. I've never been happier and more fulfilled in my life than I am now uh, as a priest and prison chaplain. Uh, but to get there, I certainly had to uh, learn and search. And a very favorite uh, quotation of mine from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, goes, I will show you treasures of darkness, riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord. And finding those treasures of darkness, which takes quite a lot of digging, quite a lot of discipline, um, and it's not an easy ride, but on the other hand, uh, once one is walking with God, um, the joys and the fulfillment are enormous. And I certainly know a lot about that. Well, that's powerful. And uh, those are precious, precious words. I, I did want to show a, a, a picture uh, of you at the Old Bailey, but this time not being sentenced as it was back in 1999, uh, but actually this was the reception for your ordination as a minister. There you are on the platform greeting everyone in the beautiful building. And I, uh, as a witness to that day, and also just as someone following your life and career, I was so blessed to see what God can do if we will let him, because you know, all have sinned to come sure to the glory of God, and we all need redemption. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, you everyone, to... for joining us. Jonathan, we have just five or ten seconds. Say a prayer before we go. Lord Jesus Christ, even in this difficult year of the pandemic, show us in the words of Isaiah the treasures of darkness, the riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know I am the Lord. I'm a the most grateful people and happy people and fulfilled people because I was shown those treasures of darkness. May many others in these times of darkness find those same treasures. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us, Jonathan. I encourage you to go on Amazon or any bookstore, look up the name Jonathan Aiken and a myriad of books over 18 he has written, including articles uh, and publications, papers, magazines, and so forth. So God bless you, Jonathan. Thank you. And Thank you. God bless each of you who are watching. We all need redemption. Our story is the story of Jesus, his love, forgiveness, and reconciliation. God bless you. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.